Blessed are the poor in spirit, verse 3, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so I want to talk tonight about um, poverty of spirit. What does that mean? What, is, what did the Lord ta- uh, mean when he talked about, um, you know, having a spirit um, that is poor? What is that what is that talking about? And so we want to talk about the core values of the kingdom of God. The Sermon on the Mount really uh, uh, is the core values of what we believe as believers, as Christians. It's what the Lord came to, to do and to say in the earth in this hour. So it says here, and if you're looking in your notes, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' most comprehensive statement on a believer's role in cooperating with God's grace. It is what we call the litmus test to measure our spiritual development and ministry impact. That's kind of an overview of what the Sermon on the Mount is. Jesus calls us to make, to make our primary life goal to seek to walk perfect by walking in all the light the Spirit gives us as we embrace the Beatitudes and we help others to do the very same. How many know that the Lord wants us to grow spiritually? Amen? He wants us to be mature as believers. And I know many of us, you know, most of us, all of us really came, you know, from uh, lifestyles where we didn't know God at all. I came from a lifestyle. I, did, I never heard, I mean, I heard the name Jesus, but I didn't know anything about God uh, until later on in my teen years. And um, I've said before that when I was younger, um, I, I was born in Europe, came to America, and I, there were people that I knew that were going to church on Sunday morning, but they were going to Sunday school. And I used to wonder, well, what is school on Sunday? I, I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't know that there was actually school on Sunday, but that's just because I was so ignorant about the things of God. I didn't know anything about the Lord and about walking in righteousness and, and knowing God. And then I came to know Christ. And I think I shared with most of you guys before that um, before I knew the Lord, I was, you know, I was just messed up on drugs and alcohol and all kinds of stuff. I just didn't know anything about living for God. And then the Lord became real to me, and I surrendered my life to the Lord. And I said, God, here I am. If you, know, if, if you want me the way that I am, God, I surrender my life to you. Just take what is left of my life. And I gave it to God, and, and the Lord took my life. And uh, he made something beautiful out of it, right? It's good to have a, self, a good self-image, right? How many know that God can take something that's messed up, and he can clean it up and make it a trophy uh, of his. Amen. He can put that trophy on the wall and said, this is my beloved. This is my son. This is my daughter. And you may not think of yourself that way, but that is what God uh, has done for you. And that is what he has available for you as you give your heart to him and your life to him really every day. It's not just a one-time experience, but it's an everyday walk with the Lord. And so the Lord says in Matthew chapter five, you shall be perfect. In other words, you shall walk in all the light that you receive, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so the Lord begins to shine His light into our hearts as we seek Him, as we read His Word, as we pray, the light of the Lord begins to shine into our heart, and it changes us, and it changes our want-tos, and it changes how we live. It just It's, it's not like you have to necessarily... You know, I'm going to try really hard to live right. It's like the Lord just gives you the desire. I want to serve the Lord. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the, it says here that the eight Beatitudes, there are eight of them. I call them beautiful attitudes. <laughs> the eight Beatitudes are being poor in spirit, spiritual mourning, walking in meekness, hungering for righteousness, showing mercy, embracing purity, being a peacemaker and enduring Uh, persecution, when you're being persecuted and people rail at you because of your Christian faith, that you don't get mad at them and upset, but that you take it and and just love them anyway. All right, let's talk about poverty of spirit. It says in um, Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who see their need. How many are needy tonight? I mean, you know, you just know it. I need God. Amen. We all are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who see their need, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn spiritually, for they shall be comforted. To be, born, to be poor in spirit is to be aware that we are in great need of experiencing spiritual growth in our heart, in our ministry, in our church, in the culture around us. It's when we come to terms with that and we say, God, I need you. I know as the leader of this house of prayer that I can't do what God has called me to do without him. I can't do it without the Lord. I am totally dependent on Christ. I can't do one thing without the Lord. It's like every day I have to come to Christ and say, Lord, here I am. God, fill me up afresh and anew today and help me, Lord, live this life that you've called me to live. This truth is one of the most misunderstood and misapplied truths in the grace of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to see ourselves as spiritually poor instead of spiritually rich in terms of our ability to experience and impart spiritual life without the Spirit of God. Let me say that again, or let me say it a different way. Without the Spirit of God, you have nothing to offer anybody. There's absolutely nothing there. We all need the Holy Spirit of the Lord to help us impart life and help people and do things in this earth to serve the Lord in the kingdom of God. We can't do one thing without the Holy Spirit of the Lord helping us and infusing us and empowering us to do that. It's the reality of when you get to the point where you realize that you need God for everything that you do in your walk with the Lord and in life. When you get to that point, then you're, you, you are recognizing actually that you're poor in spirit. And again, you wake up in the morning in brokenness of heart. I don't mean, you know, being a sad person. You don't have to be sad to be mourning in, the, you know, mourning in spirit or poor in spirit or mourning. doesn't mean that you're sad. How many know that some people are sad all the time and they depress you, right? And uh, when you come to Christ, actually, he gives you joy. I mean, you have joy of the Lord. Now, you may not always have happiness because happiness sometimes is based on circumstances. And maybe your circumstances aren't the best that they could be. But joy is this inner feeling inside your heart that no matter what happens on the outside, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you, you know, where, you, where you're going or it doesn't look exactly the way you'd like it for it to look, you can have joy in God because you know you belong to Him, and He loves you, and He has a plan for your life, and He's going to help you walk through this life one step at a time. Everybody say one step at a time. One step. I'm going to take it today and tomorrow. I'm not going to worry too much about, you know, four years from now. I'm going to take it one step at a time, no matter what you're facing. That's what it means to be happy in the Lord. It's a happy day. You know, I was singing that goofy song this morning. I don't know if you ever heard it. It's written by this guy who was totally lost and in Hollywood and, uh, you know, back in the old hippie days and, and, um, and got delivered and set free. And uh, they used to have a Bible called, the, uh, it was called, it was a paperback Bible. It was called Good News for Modern Man. And he found it on a coffee table and he said, man, I need some good news. And I'm a modern man. So he started reading this thing and he got saved and came to know Christ. And so he started writing. It's actually a guy named Barry McGuire. Anybody ever heard of him? Barry McGuire, back in the 60s, used to write a, a rock and roll song, um, The Eve of Destruction, you know, and I'm really going back a few years. Uh, but he came to Christ, and uh, we used to uh, do things together back in the early days of um, when we got saved back in the 70s. And he wrote this song, It's a Happy Day, you know. And I praise God for the weather. It's a happy day, living it for my Lord. You know, like he could. He had just long hair, and he was playing his guitar, you know. It's a happy day, and things are going to get better, living each day by the promises in God's word. And all these crazy people around him started singing this song with him, you know. Started a revival. Amen? All right. Let's uh, go to paragraph C. Talking about poverty of spirit, this virtue starts with the awareness of our need to receive salvation and then continues through our spiritual life. It is a deep awareness of our spiritual needs and deficiencies, especially in light of the call to be perfect. Lord, your standard is that you want me to be perfect. You want me to follow you, Lord, with all of my heart. You want me to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, spirit, everything that's within me, God. That is your high standard. 
But Lord, I don't have the ability in myself. I have the want to. My will says yes, but I can't do this in my own strength. I need you, Lord. Help me, God. Help me today, Lord. Help me live for you, Lord, and walk in righteousness. Help me to hunger for you. That's what it means to walk in poverty of spirit. To be poor in spirit means that we are aware of our spiritual deficiency in our obedience or in our love. We are aware of the need for our love to be developed. Poverty of spirit is how we see ourselves, and mourning is how we feel about what we see. And so God is wanting us to realize the importance of these realities. Again, without the Holy Spirit, we have nothing to offer. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't live this life that the Lord has called us into. But thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? How many know that the Holy Spirit, when you know the Lord, He, he lives inside of you? The Holy Spirit, He lives inside of you. You can talk to Him. Good morning, Holy Spirit. You can walk through your house in the middle of the night. Holy Spirit, I just, Lord, I just worship you today. He said, and he says, praise the Lord. You know, I don't know what he said, but he brings confirmation to your heart. It's awesome when he answers you, you know, kind of scares you a little bit. Oh, what was that? The power of the Holy Spirit. Each of us have to come to the end of ourselves in God and recognize that we're poor without the Lord. Recognize that, yes, Lord, you have a standard and there's something you want me to live for, but I can't do it without you, Lord. And so I ask for your help today, God, and every day. Poverty of spirit and meekness are closely related, but not exactly the same virtue. Poverty of spirit sees our lack before God, including our inability to produce spiritual life. Meekness sees our lack before people, including using our resources to serve them. How many know that God wants you to be a meek person. Just being a meek person doesn't mean, and we've got a room full of men here tonight, okay? We're talking about meekness, and yeah, okay, yeah, uh, you know. But to be great in God is to be a meek. A meek person is not somebody who is a weak person. It doesn't mean that you, you know, that you, that you, um, you know, that you're afraid of things or that you're, uh, I, want to, I don't want, really want to use the word sissy, but you know what I'm saying? That it doesn't mean that you're kind of like, you know, I, well, whatever. Ladies are meek, but guys are not. To be meek actually means to be strong. Um, Jesus was a meek person, but he was very strong. He was, he was not a weak person whatsoever. You know, uh, there were, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, people in the temple... Uh, conducting business, uh, what, do you, what do we call them, money changers, whatever. And what did he do? He, he created a, a cord, a whip, and he, he overthrew their tables and threw them out. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. And he threw the tables out, and they all went running every direction. Birds were flying, the pigeons and the money and everything, you know. That's, that's not weakness right there. That's strength. Meekness really is what, how to define meekness, it is strength under control. It is that you are strong, but you're able to hold back the strength that you, ha- that you have instead of just kind of letting it all out and just yelling at everybody and just, you know, kind of going off the handle. Meekness is strength under control. And so God wants us to develop this, this spiritual uh, ability to be poor in spirit and to walk in meekness. Let's look at uh, paragraph E. The way that we become poor in spirit is by gaining understanding of God's highest purpose for his people. We see how much God desires to do in us and through us. We're called to walk in love for Jesus and people and then to inspire others to this lifestyle as defined by the Sermon on the Mount. It includes having a vibrant spirit with hunger for the word of God. How many have hunger in your heart for the word? Amen. It's like, I can't get enough of this. I need to read the word. When I read the word, there's supernatural strength and power that comes to my spirit on the inside. I go through times where I'm, I just feel weak. Anybody ever have a bad day? You know, you go through a bad day and you just feel like, man. And then you, you realize, man, I've not been reading the word. I need to get in the word. 
And so you get yourself into that place of getting in a word and strength comes to your heart. And so the word, the spirit of prayer, the release of the Holy Spirit, power through our words, hands, praying for the sick and and, and deeds and needs and, and situations. In other words, God wants to manifest his presence in our lives and anoint us to inspire other people to walk out the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. Let me say this. You either manifest supernatural power and energy in your life or you cause a drain to those around you. You're either exuding supernatural energy and power and there's something that's coming out of you like, whoa, you know. I want to be around that person. Will you pray for me? Put your hand on me and pray for me. Because there's something inside of you that's bigger than just you. Either that or you're, you're just a drain on people. You don't want to be a drain on people, right? Let's go to page two. Page two. You could, yeah, go ahead, man. God bless you guys. Lord bless Teen Challenge and all the men. They have to work early in the morning, right? Where are you all going to work? Car wash? One place? If you see the car wash people out there, the Teen Challenge, make sure you stop by. Drop them a 50 or 100. Get your car washed. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Page 2. Paragraph F, we can grow in this by seeing what the Scripture says about how much God will do in and through us by reading biographies of what He did through others, or by teaching that strengthens our vision to live for the fullness of the Spirit in our love, obedience, power, and wisdom. I want to encourage you to expose yourself to reading biographies, books written by people uh, that God used in a powerful way about prayer and the walk with the Lord and in the Lord in different ways. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm reading E.M. Bounds. Have you ever read any of his works on prayer? E.M. Bounds, powerful writer. I encourage you to read books like that and, and others. But it says here, expose yourself to teaching, writing, singing, and fellowship that presses in for God's fullness. This has to be an intentional activity of our heart. It's not just going to happen automatically. You're not just going to sit there, I'm a Christian, and, it, and you're just going to kind of, it's just going to, you know, happen to you. You have to intentionally press into the Lord. You have to take time. You have to get yourself in a place where you crowd out all the other noises of other people and other distractions and things that would, would try to sidetrack you from the things of God. And you have to press into the Lord. And into his fullness. <clears throat> G, each generation receives a different measure of the Spirit's power according to God's purpose. Thus, we do not exactly know exactly what the measure break, uh, or breakthrough is that the Holy Spirit will give to each of us personally or corporately in this generation. We don't, we don't know what that is. But I tell you what, I'm praying for fullness. Aren't you? <clears throat> I'm asking God. Lord, would you pour your spirit out again in this time, in this hour, in this generation? I've seen God move a couple of times. I've seen God move several times in my lifetime, in my lifetime. I'm talking about a supernatural move of the spirit of God that ushers multitudes of people into the kingdom of God, where there were demonstrations of, of signs and wonders and miracles where people knew this is God. This is not just some excited, charismatic preacher or something else or a fad or something else that's going on. This is the, the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out and lives are being changed and lives are being marked for the purposes of God. And God is taking people from all different walks of life, not really planning on living for the Lord or knowing how to live for the Lord, and all of a sudden God takes them and He apprehends them and He pulls them into His purpose and into His heart and changes them. And it's like, oh my goodness, God moving by the power of His Spirit. Do you know that you can pray for that to take place? That you can actually be gripped by that reality and you can start praying? It's kind of like, gee, let's start praying about that every week. Well, God, why can't you do 
again today what you did in the Jesus movement back in 1969, 1970. God, why can't you do today what happened in the Hebrides Islands in 19-whatever, 06, 05, whatever, when two old 84-year-old ladies started calling on God and started praying? They didn't know what else to do. They just started praying in their house, and the Spirit of God just, boom, fell on them. And the bar down the street and the people that were just hanging out, all of a sudden the Spirit of God showed up. When somebody didn't come in there and grab them and say, hey, you need to go to church, it was the Spirit of God showed up, and they all of a sudden recognized their need of the Lord, and they all walked over to the church. And there was nothing going on inside the church. It was closed up, locked up. And there was this desire to want to know God. That can happen. <coughs> we can pray right here in this house of prayer. You can pray in your church wherever you are. You can ask the Lord God, would you send your Holy Spirit? These two old ladies, they were praying Isaiah 44, 4. God, you said in your word that you will send the rain. You will send awakening. Would you do that? I used to work for a pastor years ago who was saved during the hippie movement. And he got saved because some old ladies would have prayer meetings in their house. And every so often they would say, and Lord, they, they would end their prayer time. They would say, Lord, and his name was John Lloyd. Lord, would you save John Lloyd the hippie? They kept praying that. Lord, would you save John Lloyd the hippie? And lo and behold, God reached down and saved this young man. He actually ended up in a car wreck. He tried, he was high on drugs and he tried to commit suicide. This is way back in the late 60s. He rammed his car into a bridge. This is up in, Ohio, in uh, Indiana. Rammed his car into a bridge. Boom, spun around. Ended up in a hospital. Almost died. And he said to the Lord on that hospital bed, he said, Lord, whatever is left of my life, I give it to you. And he surrendered his life to Christ. He didn't really understand what that meant. In fact, when he got out of the hospital, he started going around to pastors and churches and he tried to explain to them what had happened and how his life had changed. And most of them, I mean, he didn't know anything. You know, so he'd go to this church and that denomination. And they all looked at him like, man, you're crazy, you know. And so finally he ends up in this one church up in Indiana, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he ends up talking to the pastor. And the pastor says, I know exactly what happened to you. And he starts explaining that Christ made himself real. You've turned your life over to the Lord. And now God has a wonderful plan for your life. And it's like, oh, finally somebody knows what I'm going through, you know. And this young man, God filled him with the Holy Spirit, raised him up. He started ministering to young people. And uh, they used to have a ministry up there. It was called the Adam's Apple. Yeah. And uh, they had a newspaper. Back then we had Jesus papers, you know. Uh, under, we call them underground newspaper, you know. You want to read some heavy news, you know. People, yeah, what is it? About Jesus. And he's like, oh. Um, but it was called Hardcore. This paper was called Hardcore, and it had a picture of an apple that was eaten, with, except the core was sitting there. It was pretty funny. But he started a ministry there and started preaching to young people about, uh, and he, it was actually very unconventional at that time. He'd just have different rock bands come in, you know, a real secular environment, and then at the end of that, he'd get up and say, I just want 10 minutes of your time. And he started telling people what happened to him. He said, I, you know, I was on a bad drug trip. I tried to commit suicide, and I ended up in the hospital, and Jesus made himself real to me. And God has a plan for your life, and you can turn your life. You know, he started preaching like that, and, and multitudes of young people came to Christ. In fact, they used to have like a 1,000 people that would come out for the meetings every Friday night at the Adam's Apple. It was amazing, and it went on for like 10 years, tons of people coming to know Christ and coming to know the Lord, and, uh, and so we can walk in this fullness of the Spirit of the Lord. We can know God's plan and His purpose. Look at what it says here. Um, each generation receives a different measure of the Spirit's power according to God's purpose. That's what I'm trying to say is, God, would you come in this generation? Would you come here in Tallahassee? Would you come to Tallahassee, Lord? 
Does anything ever happen in Tallahassee? Yes, it does. <laughs> does anything ever happen in South Georgia? Yes. Yes. God moves. Things happen. The Spirit of God gets poured out. That's what we're praying for. If it's not happening, it's because we're not praying. You can pray and you can, you can bring it into existence through your prayers. You can see God move. Revival. Awakening. We got to know exactly what the measure of breakthrough that the Holy Spirit will give to each one of us personally, corporately. And in this generation, I believe God is raising up different ones that have burning hearts and God will put his mark on and he will use for his purposes and he will elevate them. I say that carefully. I don't mean that elevate in pride and, and self, but elevate in the spirit of the Lord. God will elevate people and use them and put his hand on them. And they will become a mouthpiece for the Lord and anointed by the Spirit of God and be used to do great things for the Lord. And so it says here that we can't, in and of ourselves, we cannot experience it without His help. And so we set our hearts to live in a way that positions us to receive all that God has for us. And so every day we set our hearts, God, I set my heart to seek you, Lord. I set my heart to for you to fill me up today, Lord. I set my heart for you to help me. It says here, I, we are gripped by the reality that things as they are are not good enough as they are, and we do not have the power in ourselves to correct things without a dramatic intervention of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we set our hearts to reach for the fullness. Everybody say fullness. Fullness of His purpose for us and for others. And... Uh, it says here that this message can be an offensive message because it makes people feel that they personally have a great spiritual lack and need to respond in specific ways. Yes, we do. We have a tremendous spiritual lack without God. We are nothing. We're just a pile of dirt. But thank God for Jesus. Amen? Thank God for the fact that He came and He gave His life on a cross so we could experience a new life. And we could be filled with the Holy Spirit and we could understand the purpose that he has for us for this hour. Okay, Jesus addressed this as the root problem in the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. And he says this, the Lord says, you are lukewarm, you're neither cold nor hot. And he says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He's talking to the church of Laodicea because they've drifted away from God. They don't care about the Lord that much anymore. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and you say, I have need of nothing, I have everything I need, and you do not know that you are actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke. Therefore, be zealous be eager and repent. And then he says, he gives the promise to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And so Jesus addresses this as the root problem in the church of Laodicea. When a ministry, an individual or a corporate ministry becomes rich in finances, popularity and influence, they are tempted with spiritual passivity. They become lazy, they become distracted, they become lukewarm. And we need to be careful of that and watch for that. It's like when everything is going right and you have plenty of stuff, the tendency is for us to pull back from having a heart on fire for God. Because now we got every, you know, we just kind of lay back in our easy chair, you know, laying in a hammock outside. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm not saying you can't relax. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. You know what I'm talking about. It says here, the Lord spoke to Howard Pittman in 1979. Who in the world is Howard Pittman? Do a search on Google, and you will find this Baptist preacher of 35 years who actually was laying on the operating table and died, and God took him to heaven, and he thought, oh, great, you know, I'm going to see the Lord. And he went through the first heaven, the second heaven, ended up in the third heaven. Long story short, God spoke to him and said, my church is lukewarm. 
And I'm dealing with my church in this hour, and it is time for my people to come back to me in sincerity of heart. And so the Lord spoke to him, and, and this happened in 1979, that the church in the Western world was living like the Laodiceans without knowing it. I believe we're in that type of situation again in America today. We're kind of living in this blasé, you know, lifestyle situation. God wants to bring us back into having our hearts on fire for him. L, in April 1984, Bob Jones, how many has ever heard of Bob Jones? Prophet of the Lord. Bob Jones had a, an open vision. You know what an open vision is? I've never had an open vision, I'll be honest with you. An open vision is when you are you're doing whatever and all of a sudden Jesus Christ appears to you or, or the Lord shows you something openly. Everything else around you uh, is kind of goes in, melts into the background and you see what God is, is showing you. That's an open vision. You have to be real careful that you don't say a lot. Yeah, God gave me a vision. Well, are you talking about an open vision? Well, no, he didn't really give me a vision. Well, then don't say he gave you a vision. You know, use it sparingly. If God really does give you a vision, then it's okay to talk about it. But unless he gives you a vision, you shouldn't tell everybody you had a vision. Same with a dream. <laughs> I mean, you know, God can speak to people through dreams. And he does. But make sure it's, it's actually God, like God gave me a dream. Was it God? Was it the Pizza Hut pizza last night that the, there was too many uh, pepperonis on it, you know? Oh, I had a dream. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you were burning. <laughs> Lord, help me. All right. So Bob Jones had an open vision that, that morning in 1984 in which he saw Joseph's uh, dungeon. Do you remember the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis? He was thrown into prison with a cupbearer and a baker in Genesis 40. Uh, these, they represented two types of ministry. The baker in this dream, he poisoned the king's bread. The cupbearer was innocent and was exalted to serve wine in the king's present, presence. And the Lord showed Bob Jones that the poison in the bread was ministry that did not produce humility. Did you know that there are ministries today that they do the opposite? They actually promote pride and arrogance. And man-inspired type ministry based on that very thing, pride and arrogance. You know, we are to be servants of the Lord. Amen? We are to walk in humility and meekness before the Lord. Regardless of how high God exalts us in ministry and in, his, in the use of his kingdom. We're to be humble people. And then it says, um, theirs is the kingdom. Theirs is the kingdom now instead of shall be. <clears throat> These people who humble themselves before the Lord and have a heart recognizing their need. Theirs is the kingdom. Jesus promised that any who live poor in spirit would experience the kingdom realities. That includes having a vibrant spirit. How many want a vibrant spirit? How many want a vibrant spirit tonight? Amen. Bzzz. Vibrant spirit, feeling God's presence and being a vehicle of his presence to other people. Man, Jesus is all over you. That's what that means. People see it and go, wow. Wow. Spirit of God is on you. Many lack the experience of these realities without ever connecting it to a lack of being poor in spirit. The kingdom belongs to us now. This speaks of experiencing more of the kingdom in a personal way. How many want to experience more of the Lord tonight? Amen? Let's talk about page three, our vision for the impartation of God's life. There are two different words for life used in the New Testament. One is the word for natural in animal life, the natural life that people have without, you know, just because they're alive. And then the other one is God's supernatural life, which is the word zoe. Everybody say zoe. If you know God, if you have God living on the inside of you, you've got zoe. Zoe, you have the life of God. Man, you look different. You're happy. You're smiling. I can just tell the spirit of God is inside of you. Yeah, because I got zoe. That's, that's what's different about me. 
when you go to the restaurant tonight and you're sitting there smiling at the server, talking to them, and they're wondering what's wrong with you. Do you have too much of the spirit, you, the sp- you know? Did you have too much to drink tonight? No, I'm just full of the spirit. Well, the bar is closed already, you know? No, I'm full of the spirit of God. What are you talking about? I'm full of Zoe. I got the God kind of life on the inside of me. Amen? And that's the kind of life that God wants to impart. John 6, 53 says, unless, Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life, you have no Zoe in you. John uh, 6, 63, it says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The Holy Spirit gives life. Amen? That word again is Zoe. The flesh profits nothing, but the Spirit of God gives life. Man, that's so exciting. The life of God lives on the inside of you. Paul said that no good was in him apart from God's grace. To be poor in spirit includes rightly seeing ourselves specifically in context to how our natural abilities and dedication cannot produce any spiritual life. Paul says in Romans 7, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, but I thank God through Jesus Christ. I have the Zoe kind of life in me. I have the Jesus life in me. All right, our high vision to experience and impart the Spirit's Zoe life gives urgency to press into God for a progressive breakthrough in our heart and ministry in the church. And so I want to encourage us to press into the life of God. I want to encourage us to do that on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. God, I want the Zoe kind of life. I want to press in to you, Lord. I want to know you better. I want to know you in a deeper way. All right. Um, e, we press into while having confidence that he enjoys us and that our small efforts and impact is valuable to him and that it moves him. We do not despise the smallness of our work and spiritual impact, nor do we despise growth, popularity, and human enthusiasm in our ministry, but neither are we content with it. To apply this rightly in the life of a believer, we must distinguish between our legal position and living condition in grace. What Jesus' work on the cross freely and instantly worked for us is what he now progressively works in us as we take up our cross in response to his grace. God is working in you. God is working in me. He's, he's working behind the scenes. I don't always see it. Sometimes I feel like nothing is happening. Sometimes I get frustrated with myself. Anybody ever feel that way? It's like, man, you know, I'm just not thinking very spiritual right now. And I just feel like nothing is happening. And it's like, it's almost like God allows me to get into that place so that there's a desperation in my heart that begins to focus back on Him and begins to cry out to God. It's like, Lord, help me. Deliver me out of this thing that's happening to me right now. God, I know you're the way, the truth, and the life. I know I'm saved. I know I'm called into ministry. I know I'm serving you. But right now it seems like it's just dry or whatever. And then you press into God. And the Lord opens up this new door for you. And wow, there's new life. Thank you, Lord. I mean, I was almost out of water. (laughs) In the spirit, you know. I'm gulping it down. Thank you, Lord. Many believers feel inferior to others when comparing their gifting, dedication, and achievements to theirs. This is not the same as being poor in spirit. Many believers feel condemned before God by relating to Him based on their dedication. This is not the same as being poor in spirit. The person who is poor in spirit must not embrace those kinds of lies. We must see God's enjoyment of us. How many know God enjoys you? 
The Lord loves you. He proved it. He gave his life on the cross. You know, he loves, he loves you as much as God loves Jesus. He loves you at, at the same level. There's no difference in his love for you. And you can know that love today. And you can walk in it every day. Even with your shortcomings and your weaknesses before God. You take your weaknesses and you give them to God. And you say to the Lord, God, I'm poor in spirit. Help me. And with that poverty of spirit comes supernatural strength into you. Bzzz. Thank you, Lord. Be honest with the Lord. Amen. Be honest with him. And so we must see that God enjoys us. And we must see his value on the small things that we're doing as we press in for greater breakthrough in our heart and ministry. While knowing he has more for us. What happens is a lot of people just simply quit. They just give up. They quit. I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to do that. It's useless. Doesn't do anything. That's because you quit. Don't quit. Keep pressing. Keep seeking God. You know what? You can pursue all kinds of stuff in life. You can run after it. I want this. This will make me happy. This will fill my heart. This, you know, that if I can just get that, if I can just get this. It happens to Christians all the time. If I can focus on, oh, this is what I want. I've been praying for this for 10 years. Thank you, Lord. You know, it's like the corny uh, saying that, you know, that we need to keep our eyes on the creator, not on the creation. And the minute you go after the creation, it's going to turn to dust in your hands. It's futile. Everybody say futile. <laughs> Futile. It's just, it's like in Haggai, when the temple was falling into ruin, everybody was kind of doing their own thing over here. And God says, you know what, you're working hard, you're doing all these things, and you put money in this big bag, but there's a big hole in, there, in your bag, and it all falls out. And why is that? He said, I blow on it, because you're sitting at home doing all these things that you want to do while my house is in ruins, and so I am blowing on your stuff. And that's the way it is. And so people get hard-headed, you know, and they have to get hit by with a two-by-four, four-by-four between the eyes, and boing. Man, I wish I would have known that. Why didn't I see that one coming, you know? And then you come back in again. Here I am, Lord. Well, I would have told you that if you just kept your eyes on me and not started drifting off like that. Page four. Is that where we are? Not being content with anything less than God's highest. Jesus calls us to be very careful of what we listen to or accept as the truth of Scripture. This is a most important Scripture related to understanding what it means to be poor in spirit. Look at what it says in Mark chapter 4. It's talking about the seed of the life of God. It's the very thing I've been talking about. The cares of this world. The sower went out to sow. He threw the seed out. I planted some seed recently. Got strawberries growing in my garden. A few. I got chicken wire around them. I don't want those birds to eat my strawberries. I've been working hard on those things. Huh? No, I got chicken wire. I got it all around on every side. And if that doesn't work, I got a shotgun. You know? I want those strawberries. I want all eight of those things, you know? And... Uh, and so the sower went out to sow in, in Mark chapter 4, and he threw the seed, and he was just sowing. And it says that some fell uh, on the, the hardened wayside where people walked all the time. They were trampling on the seed, you know. And then some fell amongst the thorny things and stony ground, and some fell in good ground. There's plenty of dirt over there, you know. It's nice and black and soft. Those seeds fell on that ground. And so he says that they all brought about different uh, results. And he talked about this one seed that didn't, wasn't able to grow. And, he's, and he gave the reason right here. He says, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entered in and it choked out the word. The word was trying to grow in the heart of this person. But there was all these other things competing 
for the growth of that word. And so they were all coming in, eh, you know, trying to choke that thing out. And they succeeded. It said it becomes unfruitful. And then he says, take heed what you hear or how you hear. Because all of us in this room tonight, we can all hear the same thing, but we may respond differently depending on how we hear and how our heart is positioned on the inside. If your heart is in the right place and if your heart is soft and pliable before God, when you hear something, it goes right in there and boom, it starts sprouting, it starts growing, it's healthy, it's strong. If your heart is in the wrong place, that word, it bounces off, boing, you know, it just it tries to get in and it falls back out. And so we have to cultivate our heart on the inside. God, let, me, let my heart be open and ready to hear. And so the Lord says, take heed what you hear. <clears throat> With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. It says, do not be content with outward responses to your ministry, but press on for the power to make the inward change as seen in the Sermon on the Mount. Many evaluate themselves spiritually by comparing themselves with others. It makes them feel superior and good about their ministry. But we must evaluate ourselves by the Word of God. What is the standard of Christianity that you refuse to live without and so we don't, we don't live by human comparison. We don't look at, you know, is this place jam-packed with people? Uh, is everything good in, that, in the natural? We want to make sure that we accomplish the very thing that God has called us to do and that we're faithful to the Lord. That's our measuring stick. <coughs> and so Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we dare not compare ourselves with those who, co who commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. The Laodiceans were seduced by their popularity and enthusiasm around them <clears throat> so that they no longer were pressing into God. Did you know revival? How many want revival to take place? Did you know revival, <clears throat> if not properly stewarded? Steward. Did you know what is a steward? Where's my water? A servant, a steward, somebody who is responsible for something placed in his trust. Did you know that everything God has given to you, you're a steward of it? It's not yours, it doesn't belong to you. You're just taking care of it for God. That's what a steward is. And revival has to be stewarded. Revival is when there is a supernatural move of God that nobody is doing. It's not revival just because you put on a sign out there, hey, we're going to have revival next week. And for a week, we're going to just, jing, 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 you know, <laughs> that's not revival. I mean, that's fun, and it can, it can bring revival. But that's not revival. Revival is when God supernaturally moves in a region. And not just, just that church, but many churches and many places are touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that kind of revival has to be stewarded by people who are praying. And, and if revival is not properly stewarded, I actually have one. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just refusing to take it, but thanks. I'll save it for later. Is that lemon? Okay. If not properly stewarded, it leads to greater occasion for self and flesh. Did you know that? Let me say that again. Revival, if not properly stewarded, will lead to greater occasion for self and flesh. Maybe I will have it. Thank you. Wow. I've never seen one like this. It's not translucent. It's solid. <clears throat> that is a cough drop, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. There, you can have revival come, and you can lose revival because of how people respond. I'm talking about leaders now, how you respond to it, things that you do. You can start fighting over revival. Well, I started it first, and you're not supposed you know, and I'm whatever. You can start fighting over revival. You can start merchandising revival and try to profit from it and make 
a lot of money off of it, and, and you can for a while, but you know what happens? The Spirit of God lifts off of that thing. Um, you can be so caught up in pride and arrogance thinking that you're the one that's causing the revival to come, that it's because of you, and it's not because of you at all. I mean, God is using you, yes, but you have to remain in that place of humility and brokenness before God, and you have to recognize that God can lift His hand off of that thing any moment and any time. And so it behooves us, if revival comes, that we steward the move of God properly and, and, and in, in the right mindset. That's why it's so important that we study this being poor in spirit. <clears throat> and so it says, often those in prosperous circumstances, they lack this virtue. They feel superior to others in their gifting and accomplishment, resulting in a confidence that minimizes their pressing into God, and they just get lazy in the spirit. We must continually press into God for greater love, purity, healing, and evangelism. Um, the ear tickling that Paul warned of is common today as a distorted grace message that seeks to make people feel comfortable. Most truths related to our walk with God are double-edged, having both a positive and a negative aspect. The distortion of the message is in only emphasizing the positive aspect while ignoring the negative. The net result is a message that is less than truthful. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? It's solid teaching, right? The truth of God's word, sound doctrine. But they will, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and begin to listen to fables. That's what Paul is saying. And then he says, but you, you be watchful in all things. And so the Lord gives us the challenge and the encouragement. Do not let anyone put kind but humanistic water on your fire to press in for fullness. There are many well-meaning believers who will use the Scripture in a non-biblical way in their desire to comfort other people. The result is that they put the fire out in people by making them feel good instead of following God. And it's not about feeling good. It's not about making sure the cappuccino is tasting right in service on Sunday. You know, I don't think God really cares about cappuccino. Maybe he does. I don't know. But I like cappuccino. I like coffee. Dunkin' Donuts coffee. All right. Make it early in the morning here on Mondays and Wednesdays. 6 a.m. Early prayer. You want to come join us? We have coffee. Some of you are sleeping in. I know. I got to text you. Hey, wake up. It's time to wake up. Arise and shine and give God the glory. You know, I have a few crazy people that show up, you know, at 6 a.m. Where's the coffee? You know, ready to pray. There's very few of us. What is the word? Semper, semper, semper fi. You know, always faithful. You'll always find me here on Monday and Wednesday, early in the morning. I'll be here, but I'll have my coffee. Dunkin' Donuts coffee. All right. Let's, uh, let's stop there. I want to invite the worship, worship team to come up. Lord, we just thank you for tonight. God, a special night to uh, just hear from you, Lord, and to worship you, Lord, to go deep in the things of God. Lord, I pray tonight that you would give us a desire in our hearts, Lord. Give us a desire to want to walk in humility of spirit. Lord, you said in your word that blessed are the poor in spirit, those who see their need, for theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. God, we just we see our need tonight. God, we are poor in spirit. And we ask you to help us. Lord, I pray tonight that you would bring new life into our hearts. Lord, that you would bring new and fresh illumination into our hearts. 
Lord, that you would help us. God, that you would open up our eyes and our ears to see you in a different light, in a deeper light, God. And that you would give us that desire to do that very thing, Lord. Lord, we just cry out to you right now. Lord, you said, blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Lord, we mourn for you. We mourn for the bridegroom tonight, Lord. We cry out to you, Lord. God, we ask you to come right now by your Holy Spirit. I just want to invite you all to stand, if you would. And I want to invite you to just, if you feel like this, just lift your hand before the Lord. If you're just hungry for the Lord and you just feel a tremendous need for, for the Lord to encourage your heart and strengthen your heart tonight. Lord, we just lift our hands up to you, Lord. God, we ask you to come right now. Fill us, Lord, afresh and anew. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, God. Just pour your spirit out, Lord, upon us, Lord, right now. God, we're needy for you, Lord. Some of us have been serving you for many years, decades, Lord, even. God, and Lord, we, need, we want, we desire a fresh and vibrant faith. Some of us have just known you for a short time. Some of us, Lord, are just in and out of the kingdom of God. Lord, I just ask you to help us tonight, God. Recognize our need of you, Lord. Just fill us with your spirit right now. Give us new desires, Lord. Help us to cry out to you, Lord, right now. Send your Holy Spirit. Lord, stir up our hearts, Lord. Warm our hearts by the presence of the fire of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Melt away hardness, Lord, of heart, Lord. Melt away, Lord, things that are, Lord, just keep us from you, God. I ask right now by your Spirit, Lord, that you would move, Lord, in a mighty way, God, that you would touch every heart, every person, Lord, in this room tonight, Lord, that you would move powerfully right now, God. God, just encounter us tonight, Lord. Lord, this is an encounter service, Lord. We want to encounter you, Lord. We want to meet with you, God. We want you to touch us, Lord. We want you to come, Lord, tonight by your Spirit, Lord, that our lives would be changed, oh God. Our, our eyes would be opened in a new way, Lord. Our hearts would be warmed, oh God. Lord, I just pray you would break off crustiness, Lord. I pray you would break off boredom, Lord. I pray that you would break off apathy, Lord God. We shake ourselves right now in the, with those things, Lord. We shake them off right now in the name of Jesus. God, I ask that you would give us a new vibrant faith, a new vibrant fire in our hearts tonight, Lord, that you would come, Lord, that we would know that something is different tonight, that something has changed tonight in our lives, oh Lord. God, we cry out for this, Lord. We're poor in spirit. We're hungry, God. We're needy, Lord. We ask you to come right now, Lord. Come in power. Come in by your spirit, Lord. Touch our hearts, Lord. That is our cry tonight and our prayer. We're just going to worship the Lord. Let's just stay in an attitude of prayer and worship. We're just going to worship the Lord for a little while here.